All right, we open up with the uh, topic today is responsibility. Um, how responsibility actually um, plays in Jewish law, and not just in Jewish law, but in our day-to-day -day, um, interaction, our day-to-day -day life. And we all have, uh, we know that there's, uh, we have a law, you have to follow the law, right? That's our legal, uh, uh, you're held legally to keep to the laws. The question that we're going to focus is not so much what you have to keep, what laws you have to keep, but what is the responsibilities around the laws. And, and, and we're going to focus on three case studies. <clears throat> One real life case study that happened a few years ago. It's actually going to connect with a mass shooting. Um, uh, case, case B will be a case of responsibility in monetary ideas. So first thing will be life and death. Second will be about monetary. And the third is responsibility when it comes to spiritual matters. So let's open up with case study A. Um, that was eating, I'll read it for you. Page 76 in your book. So Joseph Meek Jr., friend of Dylan Roof, who spent time with him in the weeks before nine people were killed at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church here, was sentenced Tuesday, this is out of 2017, to 27 months in prison for hampering and misleading the federal authorities in the aftermath of Mr. Roof's racist massacre. Mr. Meek, 22, pleaded guilty last April to two federal counts related to the truthfulness of his response to the FBI in the interview shortly after the shooting on June 17, 2015. Miss Prison of a felony making a false statement to a law enforcement officer. Miss Prison refers to a failure to report a known crime. The government did not prosecute Mr. Meek for failing to disclose knowledge of Mr. Roof's plans to attack the church, although it asserted in court filings that his silence did deprive law enforcement of the opportunity to intervene. So in other words, <clears throat> this evil person, Mr. Roof, killed nine people at his church, black church, but he, his friend, Joseph Meek, knew about the plans, but didn't tell authority in advance. He knew in advance that this guy is planning to do a mass shooting, but didn't tell the authority or he lied to authority. During the night of drinking and drug use about a week before the shootings, Mr. Roof told Mr. Meek that he wanted to kill black people at a historic African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston in order to start a race riot. According to FBI summaries of interviews with, with him, Mr. Meek was concerned enough to hide Mr. Roof's handgun after he fell asleep, but later returned it and did not report the threat to law enforcement. Certainly, defendant's failure to make an earlier report is tragic and deeply regrettable, but his failure to report was not a violation of federal criminal law. Judge uh, Jergel wrote last week in an order that denied prosecutors' request to give Mr. Meek a longer term than recommended in sentencing guidelines. In his initial FBI interview, Mr. Meek denied having known of Mr. Roof's plans and said Mr. Roof had not spoken of a target for his attack. According to the Assistant United States Attorney Julius Richardson. But in the second interview, Mr. Meek admitted that he had lied. According to an FBI synopsis of this session, he also admitted that on the night of the shooting, after concluding that Mr. Rue was responsible for the attack, he told others not to con contact law enforcement. So the question here is Joseph Meek knew of Dylan Rue's intention to commit a massacre and chose not to report it to the authority who could have prevented it. Despite that, his failure to report a planned crime in advance did not constitute a legal offense. In your opinion, should the act of reporting a plot that involves serious crime be considered A, commendable, B, morally imperative, or C, a legal obligation? Anybody? Morally imperative. Morally imperative. Okay. Anybody disagree? Anybody say a legal obligation? Yes. yes. Also. also, yes? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, should be, but law is different. Huh? Should be, but the laws don't um, mandate it. Correct. It should be, but the law is not like that. Um, actually, in Europe, there's some countries that do have the law, but in, in America, it's not 
it's 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 not a legal obligation. Even more so, this is I I said this classes once. Uh, we had a police officer this morning here with a little more little story. Even the police cannot even act. It's crazy part. Something they cannot act on 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 a on information they're getting from a stranger about a, some upcoming event. They, if they have no evidence or something, just oh yeah, a guy told me. They um, this is so crazy that the legal law sometimes doesn't even permit law enforcement to act upon that. Okay, study B, huh? In Texas, they said that's, not that's not true. Okay, obviously, but there has because to be. What happened with the kid that just got arrested? Which kid? Huh? He made a threat, so they arrested. Which kid, Thomas? Uh, didn't get mm -hmm. I don't know about it. Okay. He made, okay. right. he made yeah. a threat. He, if he made a threat, if somebody reports a threat. Well, somebody reported that he made a threat. Okay, all right. All right. Skip, skip what I said. No problem. Okay, but uh, we, but but we understand in this case legally, um, probably it's morally imperative, but it's not a legal obligation that you must report. Correct. Right? You must report a threat that you know about, or it's it's it should you should report. No, okay. I think there is a big. Okay, let's see. Let's see. We're gonna see some case B. Page page B. The Rachel. This this is I think more a hypothetical case. Okay, a hypothetical. Rachel strolls along the streets one evening, passing a store that is closed for the night. Glancing through the window, she noticed that the air conditioner was left on when it was supposed to be turned off, costing the store owner money. Rachel is unaware of the store owner's identity, but she may be able to receive the owner's contact details from the operators of nearby stores that are still open. In your opinion, should the effort to alert the store owner to, cost, to a costly oversight be considered okay. It's uh, the weekend, so it's Memorial Weekend. That's going to be on for five days. I'd say, right? So, is, should it be considered commandable? Be morally imperative or legal obligation? Commandable. commandable. Okay. Morally imperative. Morally imperative. Okay. Good. Anybody else? Anybody think it's a legal obligation? No. 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 All right. Let's go to case C. We're going to analyze this. This is a a, a, a kind of. A, I, want to, I don't want to read the case here. I want to show it to you because it's a it's sort of Pew Research Center. It's a painful um, analysis that basically that one out of four Jewish adults do not identify themselves as with the Jewish religion. They made a research that one out of four American Jews adult do not identify themselves as Jewish religion. Okay. If you look here, let's see, we have, we have the chart on page 80. I don't know if I have it here on the. Uh... It should be punishable by law. <laughs> okay, if you look over here, um, here the no? here's the stats. Okay, so you see, the older it is, the people 65 and plus, 84 um, percent identify as Jews. Yeah, okay, meaning they 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 researched, they they interviewed Jews, right? Not non-Jews, Jews who were born Jewish. And they ask them, do you identify yourself as Jew by religion or Jew by no religion, of no religion, right? So 60, or let me they're agnostic or atheists or others, whatever, they, you know. So 84% of people 65 plus, yes, they're Jews by religion. But the lower you go, see the lower it goes, the number drops, the number drops to like a staggering 40% in ages 18 to 29. All right, the 40% consider themselves Jews of no religion. So that's where Judaism comes to you with age. Huh? Yeah. 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 Right. So this is perfect. Place. What? Judaism comes to you with age. <laughs> and this is perfect. I wish you are right. The Judaism comes with you with age. I wish you're right. Sadly, sadly. Yes. Yeah. Venice is, is a perfect place. For like that. me. <laughs> well, it, the good thing is that yes, that that we come when you come of age, you become wise and you realize what's important. But by majority, it's sadly the other way around. It is that we, the newer generation, is not getting exposed to beauty and inspiration of Judaism. So just think, you think that the uh, lower bracket, as they get older, they're going to get more involved? Yeah. We hope so, and maybe that's what we are supposed to do. And that's really the question, right? What should we do to reverse the trend of weakening Jewish identity? 
And number two, is someone else's degree of religious observance or Jewish identity any businesses of ours? That's really the key question here. Is somebody else religious observant any business of mine? I have a certain responsibility or do I need to care about? It's a mitzvah. Huh? Yes. What are you yes. saying? Yes or no? Yes. Your obligation. Huh? Your obligation. Okay. Well, we are not, we are a very biased crowd here, right? Obviously, you're sitting here in a Torah class, right? You care about Judaism, right? So you're very biased on it. Of course, you want everybody else to be involved. Okay. In the from whose perspective? Huh? Who's perspective? From who perspective? Right now, I'm asking. From God's perspective? Or from God's okay. So what about his Let's, let's, it's a doctor asked a good question. From whose perspective? I'm going to, I'm going to say, can we look at it from an objective Torah perspective? Forget about other streams, right? We're going to present others because, because in essence, it's not a conversation for really now. In essence, we want to know <laughs> what's the what's the what's the Torah. We're going to read Torah. We're not going to read uh, um, Chabad teachings of uh, three hundred years ago or Sappho teachings. We're going to read Torah teachings, ancient Torah. Teachings. What does the Torah teach in terms of obligation to one another when it comes to spiritual um, spiritual matters or spiritual uh, identity um, and and um, and, I, and, and um, who we are as a people. All right, let's go to, before we begin, let's just address one thing. Number one, when we're talking about Jewish law, right? Just like we have American law that applies to Americans, right? I know we have some uh, foreigner here in the class, <laughs> Renee. Um, so American law doesn't apply in Austria, right? Jewish law really only applies to Jews, not to non-Jews. So a lot of the teachings don't are not necessarily uh, universal laws, there are responsibilities, to, or especially the question of regarding responsibility is what is our responsibility as Jews taught by God in the Torah. Of course, we take some of those values and make that a societal and would share with society because some of those values are important universally. So especially when it comes to responsibility, we're focusing very much as Jews, what is my responsibility. So let's start with the actual giving of the Torah, which is very good timing because Shavuos is about giving the Torah. And we'll go, go to text one. In text one, the Jewish people became a nation at Mount Sinai, right? Seven weeks after the Exodus of Egypt. And this is what it says in Exodus. The people, page 83, the people all responded in unison. And God says, do you want the Torah? We said, we will do everything God has said. Right? Naaseh, and later on we said, Naaseh ben Ishma, we will do and we listen. Okay, the classic joke God asked them, Do you want the Torah? And the Jews said, Yes, how much does it cost? <laughs> and God says, It's free. It says, Okay, give us two. That's why we have two tablets. It's a huh? It's so classic. It's, I can repeat it once a week and once a laugh. Okay. Yes, okay. Huh? I heard it. <laughs> All right. So, 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 but the people said, okay, we will do everything God has said. But the Medrash sees a great importance in this united response. It says, respond in unison. What does that mean in unison? So, text two when the Jewish people accepted God's rule at Mount Sinai, they did so joyfully as one, as the verse states, the people all respond in unison. In doing so, they even committed to serving as guarantors for each other. Yeah. What does that mean? Wow. What does that mean that they agreed to be guarantors for each other? So just like you take a loan, right? No. If you take a loan and, and, and they, they want to have a guarantor, somebody's going to guarantee the loan, they can take responsibility. God needed to have guarantors. So there's two uh, there's two parts of this medrash. One is not relevant over here, but I'll explore it in any way. It's because great because it's true. God asked the Jewish people, you're going to accept the Torah, but who's going to guarantee that you're going to keep it? So they said, Moses. <laughs> God says, okay, but Moshe is going to live uh, another 40 years. And then what? All right, the prophets. So the prophets also going to die eventually. And they said, okay, the, the teachers. So they're also going to go. Until the people said, to God, the children, 
The children will be the guarantors, meaning we're going to ensure to teach the children Torah so they can take it and make sure that we can bring it to the next generation. And that's why we bring the children. In addition, we come to synagogue on Shavuot, we bring the children. If you see, we bring ice cream and, and toys. We're going to get them excited. Even, even a little babies, we bring them into synagogue on Shavuot. My daughter, Nahama just turned 18 on Shabbos. 18 years ago, right? She was born a week before Shavuot, which was seven days old. I took her into the big show in Brooklyn to hear the Ten Commandments. All right. So if you come here on Sunday, you might see some other babies as well. Uh, Not an incentive to get the kids are going to give them ice cream. The bubbies are going to say, hey, there'll be babies here, right? To write on the advertisement. Babies will be in show. Shane the Punims. All right, moving on. But the second part, the second part is not just that they are going to, but that we are going to be guarantors for each other, meaning that we accept in unison responsibility for one Jew to another Jew. And this covers all commandments, not just loving your neighbors. This covers all commandments, spiritual commandments, religious commandments, as well, civil commandments, right? And it's still Jewish guilt. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's real. It's not a Jewish guilt thing. It's real. The parable, uh, the measure gives us, beautiful parable on page 85, text 3, all Jews are mutually responsible. This can be compared to a ship where a hole ruptured in one of its cabins. We do not exclaim a cabin has ruptured. Why do we say the entire ship is ruptured, right? So there's a real key difference of Jewish law, responsibility, and secular law. In secular law, you have a hole in your boat. That's your problem, right? You can scream for help, 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 right? So then, okay, maybe somebody next uh, who's driving uh, who's driving a boat next, next to you will come and rescue you. But... He doesn't have to. We look at in Judaism, we look that when there's a hole in the boat, it's not his boat that the ruptured, it's my own boat. It's like we are one big ship, right? If you have a big boat, if you're on a cruise liner and somebody's cabin is leaking, right? And he's screaming, there's a, there's a hole, can't say, okay, it's his problem, right? You know, if you don't take care of that problem, it's gonna affect everyone. So this is how we look as moral, as, in, and as not just moral, but we have a legal obligation to be responsible for each other. Why? Because Torah looks at, at, at every Jew. We are here with a common mission. We have a common mission. Maimonides describes this in text four very powerfully. Text four, page 86. We should always consider ourselves and the entire world as equally balanced between merit and guilt. If we perform one transgression, we may tip our personal balance and that of the entire world to the side of guilt and we bring destruction upon everyone else. My action is gonna affect everybody else. Like talking with a scale, right? You know those scales, those old fashioned scales, right? It's 50-50. One bad action, it's not gonna only affect me, it's gonna affect everybody else. Conversely, if we perform one mitzvah, we may tip our balance and that of the entire world to the side of merit, bringing deliverance and salvation to all. This dynamic is reflecting the verse, a righteous person is the foundation of the world, meaning that a person who acts righteously tips the balance of the entire world and saves it. All right, so just the uh, personal responsibility from the secular perspective, the Torah perspective, every individual action affects our common goal. We put the boat analogy, um, and now um, we are going to, as Maimonides uh, is, says it so nicely, our action really affects the whole world. Um, and also on a soul level. So one more point, because in Hebrew, responsibility comes from the word, let me add it here. Arevut. Anybody hear the word Areven, uh, Zeloze? Our raven tells that means we are responsible for each other. We guarantors for each other, responsible for each other. But that is because we look at it as we are one people having one common mission. So like a football team, right? We're like a, we're a team and every player has its part to do. If one player just quits, you can't say it's just my problem, it affects everybody else. So that's a team analogy. 
you know, the Yeshiva University had a rowing team. You know Yeshiva University? Sure. So they had a rowing team, but they always lost to all the other colleges. <laughs> always lost. Huh? You know, they always lost. Couldn't figure out why they're always losing. So one day they decided, they said, Yanko should go and spy onto the Yale University's rowing team. How do they do it? Because they always win. They always have the winning part. So he spies behind the bushes, and he comes back running. And he says, guys, I got the secret. He says, what? It is one guy yelling and eight people rowing. <laughs> let's, go, let's go a bit deeper than that. Let's go a bit deeper. And this is more on a soul level. Kabbalah says that true mutual Jewish mutual responsibility is also is, is also connected to the idea that we are all neshamas, we're all souls. And on the soul level, we are not like different players in the one team. On the soul level, those also learn Kabbalah and the Tanya class know very well. On the soul level, we actually all one. We are all interconnected. So look at text five by the great Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, Spanish. Uh, sage in the Middle Ages, and he writes as follows. All Jews are interrelated because our souls are commingled and we each share a part of each other's soul. So that this, this, is, this is why all Jews bear mutual responsibility. We each possess an actual spiritual part of our fellow. Since the point is not just that we are team players, I and you are one, meaning you is really part of me. Right, and I and my soul is also part of yours. So as a result, when one Jew transgresses, the action causes damage to themselves and inflicts damage to the part of them that is shared by the fellow Jews. Therefore, we should all seek out each other's benefit, rejoice in each other's success, respect our fellow Jew as we respect ourselves, because we really are one. This is the basis of the commandment, love your fellow as yourself. Meaning we're not only sharing a common mission, right? But we have a common identity. It brings out the, 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 the aspect of responsibility to even a deeper understanding, deeper idea. We don't have that in circle law at all, right? In circle law, it's a what? It's Mind your own business, right? It's my rights versus your rights, right? Okay. There's very little talk about responsibility towards others. Okay, so sometimes, you know, a doctor, law enforcement, they have a certain responsibilities to society that they took the oath for, right? Versus a regular person. But it's, a, it's again, limited to their profession. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's ingrained. It's part of our who we are as people. Let's get practical. <laughs> let's get back, let's go with practical. Okay, clear to now? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about um, more in the detail on material things. How do we take this value and express it when it comes to material well-beings of others? We know we have many mitzvot of charity, right? Sadaka is not just voluntary, Rather, it's a responsibility that we need to help each other. It's an obligation, tzedakah's obligation. Um, and we're not gonna talk about tzedakah today. We had a whole course on that, but we're going to talk about um, resp other responsibilities about protecting somebody else from harm. It's another element, right? There's something helping somebody who's, who, who needs something or a organization that needs to sustain itself. How about me? Watching somebody else having potential damages, and I watching it have the ability to stop it. The Torah says very clearly in Leviticus, text 6a, do not stand by the shedding of your fellow's blood. Simply means when it comes to life and death, you cannot watch somebody get hurt. However, Maimonides gives us more details on this commandment in 6b about active intervention when you see somebody else in danger as follows. 
Page 88, 6B. Somebody want to take over the reading? Alex, go ahead. <laughs> Me? Yeah. yeah. Huh? I can, I'm a good listener. You're a good listener. <laughs> Heidi Peterson, yeah. text B, 6B, page 88. This prohibition forbids us to refrain from intervening to save others when we see that they are in danger of death or financial loss and we have the ability to rescue them. For example, if someone is drowning in the sea and we are able to swim up and save him, or if robbers are planning to kill someone and we are able to dissuade the brothers or protect the victim from harm. Regarding all such cases, we are commanded do not stand by the shedding of the fellow's blood. Correct. So, so in other words, if we can save, it's not optional. Not optional, we must, we must save a other person, right? Even if it's not a Jew? Huh? Yes. You don't ask them, are you Jewish? Then I'll save you. No. No, when I said earlier that the laws are regards to Jews, it's not referring how we treat other humans. It is a question, is my responsibility as a Jew? But of course, we must take care of all your mankind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we are nice people. Huh? He saved the person without knowing if he's a Jew. So I would ask him if this is a myth. All right, so let's go to case study, um, case study one, right? Um, so re remaining silent when aware of a threat actually is a crime. So case number one, case study one with this American, uh, this mass killer, right? <clears throat> Second law does not hold another responsible. Generally, only acts of commission not are criminalized, not omission. All right. Possible gateway to totalitarian Italian style government. Why is it that the circle law is not obligation to inform others of, that you know they are about to do a crime? Because circle law A focuses on the actual crime, not on potential crimes. And B, they're worried about a, a, if everybody's going to start becoming policemen, right? Right? Then you have the possible gateway to totalitarian style government, which basically means, right? Um, uh, we're going to start calling, uh, oh, this guy's doing this, this guy's doing this. We're going to start sneaking everybody else, and we're going to start playing police. This is one of concern of cycle society. Yes. Yeah, but our legal system also is based on that you are innocent until proven guilty. Correct. So until there is an act of commission, you're innocent. Correct. 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 Right. Until there's an act, you till, till you're actually doing, you're innocent, no matter what. So innocent until proven. To proven guilty. Under the law. Correct. So not only that. Well, I will live here. Yes. Um. All right, and then there's also difficulty determining a person's advanced knowledge. And all those are basically the reason why Encyclopedia does not hold another responsible for not responding. <laughs> yeah, you heard somebody say so, so what? You know, maybe he doesn't mean it. I mean, it's always hard to watch, you know, after a horrible uh, crime or shooting something, right? That there were some, you know, they, they've posted something on Facebook, they did already, nobody really picked it up, or nobody really cared. All right, let's go. In Jewish law, how would Jewish law say on case A? Do we have an obligation when we find out that somebody's about to harm somebody else? Yes, we do. Absolutely, absolutely, no question. Jewish law obligates a person to save another's belongings uh, and, and to, to save somebody else from any harm, okay? How about monetary things, okay? Monetary responsibility. So, The idea is that Jewish law obligates a person to save another's belonging from theft or damage. If you know, look at text seven. Text seven talks about, um, you shall not witness, page 89. You shall not witness your fellow's ox or sheep straying and ignore them. Rather, you must return them to your fellow. So must you do with anything lost by your fellow. So here the Torah says, we have an obligation to stop a loss before it happens. You see across the street that your neighbor's dog is running out on the street, right? You have an obligation to go 
and retrieve the dog. Definitely. Huh? Be human. Be human. Yeah. Now, but not as a human idea, not only as a, it's a nice thing to do, be a mensch, yeah. but more than that, you have an obligation. Oh, obligation. Because why do I say that? Because the question is to what extent? To what extent do I have to prevent somebody from monetary law? So when it comes to life and death, you got to do everything you can, right? Even if it costs money to save somebody's life. The exception is, do you have to put yourself in danger to save somebody's life? And the answer is no, because your life comes first. In other words, if you see somebody drowning in the beach and the waters are very choppy and you're not such a good swimmer, do you have an obligation to go and save the person? You might drown yourself. It happens, right? Yeah. Then you don't have to do it. But if you're a good swimmer and it's calm and you're walking by the beach and somebody's drowning, you must go. Obligation, not nice, be a mensch. Obligation. You consider it a, almost a murder in Jewish law. If you just watch, do not stand idle by your fellow's blood. Yeah. When it comes to monetary thing, the question now becomes a little bit more, you know, so how far do I have to go to prevent somebody from monetary loss? Do I have to spend money to, to save somebody's monetary object? Let's say, um, <clears throat> let's take an example. Let's say somebody's. Uh, um, I'm not gonna like. I'm not gonna bring the dog example because everybody has a heart for dogs, right? Oh, okay, so we're not gonna use that one. <laughs> okay, let's say. Let's say. Um, let's say you found somebody's car, right? Found somebody's car, and um, you live in New York, <laughs> right? And you know that the owner is in Australia for two for two for for, for two weeks, and you can't reach them, but you found the car. You're going to retrieve the car, but you're going to have to pay for parking for the car, right? It's not, it's not cheap, right? Do you have obligation to pay for, to pay to save somebody um, from a loss of, of an object? That's the, so the question is to what extent? That's a heavy question. Oh, that's a heavy question. Yeah, yeah. let's hear the numbers. Huh? Let's hear the numbers. <laughs> huh? Yeah. That it doesn't cause hardship to yourself, like undue hardship to yourself. Like if I had to board someone's car, that's like three hundred dollars a day, or something, right. right? So that would quickly cause. Well, can you can you can you can you have the owner pay you back? Is the owner obligated to pay you back? Yes. Huh? Definitely. Also, no. Huh? Not obligated. It's not. Man, she should. Should <laughs> believe it. Yeah, you have an obligation to it's humans, not me. Right. You can't contact the person. You it's can't contact the person. Yes. That's a very difficult. So, I don't know. No, that's why I said, let's hear the numbers. Let's hear the numbers. <laughs> you know, you know, you know this joke. The guy in Manhattan. You know, the joke. The guy in Manhattan comes to the bank and asks for a loan of five thousand dollars. So the bank says, "Okay, do you have a collateral?" He says, "Yeah, I have a car." So he says, "Okay, give me the car," and he pulls in with his Rolls Royce. And the, <laughs> and the bank director takes the takes his, looks at Rolls Royce and says, "If you have a Rolls Royce, why do you have to need a loan for five thousand dollars?" He says, "Where else can get free parking for two weeks in Manhattan?" <laughs> <laughs> Over your head. You didn't know. You're not from an, you're not from the city. Okay. Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars yesterday. Okay. Okay. All right. Point, 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 point here is how far do we go? Welcome to the Talmud. This is exactly a classic case where it could be so many variables, right? So many variables, and the Talmud will go back and forth and discuss it. But it's not just okay. Let's put our logic together. Let's let the rabbi sit around the table and let's see whoever can get. The, give us the best logic and we'll apply the logic. Their logic must be rooted in Torah as well. So they will analyze every word, every letter in Torah and try to ex extrapolate some of the details that can be applied to logic. And I've taught you there's these 13 principles of application of systems of how we can interpret laws because we have many cases that are not discussed in Torah, not even discussed in Talmud, so how do we know? 
but there's a certain system that we have in Talmud and the oral Torah, not important for now, but let's take an example here. All right. Just on the verse we just read, text seven, and what's following, and we're going to fast. Somebody last week said, I'm speaking too fast. No, 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 no. <laughs> Lots of territory to cover. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and I, I apologize if I speak too fast. Okay. Please understand that these teachings bring me back 25 years ago in Yeshiva. Yeah. When we studied this and we discussed them, we spoke very fast and we were arguing the baby. So I'm going to try to be slow. All right. Not too slow? I don't charge, okay. buddy. <laughs> Okay, so on this last line, let's go to the last line, text seven. Okay. Um, it says, so must you do with anything lost by your fellow, right? So Chris gives an example of a uh, fellow's ox or sheep, strain, whatever, you must return it to the fellow. And then it says, so must you do with anything lost by your fellow. Now look what the Talmud text eight has to say on this line. Rabbi taught, the verse states, so must you do with anything belonging to your fellow. Because what is the extra line, so must you do, bring, teach, teach us? So Rabbi says, it teaches us that any belonging to your fellow, you must always bring it back, look out and bring it back to its own. Um, by the way, the loss of returning ownership is a whole tract in the Talmud, which we're going to actually do, I think, lesson five. We're going to have another case. Meaning, if I, lose, if I find an object on the street, I, I find a camera on the street, it's not, it's the same thing. I have an obligation to take the object and try to find the owner. And there's a system. Huh? What happened to the finest keepers? Right. Right. <laughs> Rabbi Hanania said to Rabbi, second part, there is an earlier teaching that supports your ruling. If you observe flood water advancing towards your fellow's field, you must erect a barrier to protect the field. So, in other words, it's not only to restore the items, not only to restore the item to the owner, but also to prevent loss to the owner. To what extent? Here comes the time with text nine. Okay. Page uh, 91. That one's good. If you find your own lost object alongside your father's lost object. Retrieving, so which one comes first? Retrieving your personal asset takes precedence. If you encounter your own lost object alongside your teacher's your personal asset takes precedence. Precedence, precedence right? Mm -hmm. Your asset takes precedence over those of anyone else. So your property comes first, right? Doesn't say the rabbi's property, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> From where is this law derived? Rabbi Yehuda quoted Ralph. The verse states, so that there should be no impoverished, in, 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 impoverished among you. You must avoid becoming impoverished so your asset take present, yeah. present over the assets of anyone else. However, Rabbi Huda quoted a warning issued by Rav. People who are strict in the application of this principle will eventually meet the, impov the impoverished state they are seeking to avoid. In other words, when it comes my my property versus somebody else's property, right? I, I, I go and I see right, my bike, I found my bike and my father's bike, right? I can only pick up one bike. Whose do I pick up? Mine. Why? Because, I mean, you can choose to pick up your father if you're a mensch, but the question is not what you, uh, what you encourage to do, the question is what's the obligation? Why mine? Because if I don't pick up mine, I'm going to incur a loss. I'm going to lose my bike by helping somebody else having, preventing a loss, right? So we clearly see that to what extent do I have to go to saving another's belonging as long as it doesn't cost me any money, as long as I don't have a, a monetary loss. 
the, the Talmud also warns at the end, right? Don't become a, be a mensch. In other words, don't be so strict, right? Um, oh, it's going to cost me five cents, right? Mm -hmm. To, uh, you know, to give a little gas to this car, right? Don't be, because if you're going to be so from, we say, so religious on this law, then, you know, there's a God in the world. He's watching, right? Eventually, if you're going to try to always save yourself from not becoming poor, and in that process, other people come poor, eventually you'll get poor as well. Okay. Oh, I like that. You like that. Yeah, Karma, like, right? Yeah, you like that. Yeah, yeah. Fairness. Fairness. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fairness. It all comes back to times when sheep were roaming and they didn't have fences. So if this sheep roams over onto your property, what is their obligation to bring it back? And it comes back to responsibility for everything yeah. for itself. You know, if you don't take care of your sheep, then you're going to be right. angry. But it's Why not today? Agrarian, huh? Don't forget about the sheep. One second. Sheep. One second. One second. And you say you say that does, those cases don't apply to those cases don't don't find don't. Oh, no, they they are the precedent right. for this. Correct. So it's you know understanding that they they really were talking about you're going to be hungry if you don't have more sheep right. your neighbor's going to be hungry if his and you don't return his okay they just it, there weren't delineated boundaries like there are now because animals just roam okay I'm saying that we can there's a lot, so many parallels today as well mm -hmm. to those sheep cases right. <laughs> The sheep come back by themselves. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm going to ask everyone a question here this, that I had this morning. So I had a question this morning. It's not so related to this, but it's a question I'll leave, I'll leave you up. Okay. So last night, there was a thief outside stealing one of the bikes outside. Okay. Yeah, one, one of the kids' bikes. Wow. Okay. And I have it on camera. So at 2 a.m., I have it very clear on camera that two, a couple, or a man or husband, mm -hmm. they're coming on, a, they, they're, they're schlepping six bikes. <gasps> wow. They're, they're tying bikes. bikes and they're getting these, you know, the baby uh, add-on. Huh? Oh, no, 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 no. Mine was, mine was number six. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mine was number six. Oh, okay. Six they're, and, they're walking with them. and they're schlepping those bags, okay? So I called the police this morning, the police report, mm -hmm. and the police alpha says, okay, well, if we catch them, do you want to press charges? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hmm, press mm -hmm. charges. Why would I want to, this like, that one, no, I, I don't care so much about the bike. I mean, coming I, on I, the property. I, yeah, hey, mom, but, okay, I, we're going to open up a whole kind of discussion, sir, right? Okay, but, and I asked the police officer, what do you think? Should I press charges? Yeah. He says, we're not supposed to give, tell you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I says, I'm a rabbi, can you help me? But they can't move all the way to the property. Okay, all right, let's, let, let, let's, let's stop here. <laughs> huh? I says, call me when you catch them. <laughs> because I think perhaps, perhaps, hey, what are they doing with it, right? What are they doing with this stuff? Selling for drugs. Oh. Mm -hmm. And there's other bi other bikes that they have stolen, and I have the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so I maybe have an obligation for the other I'll bikes be to be retrieved, <laughs> and and see right and see and, and prevent harm from further. So yeah. so we will uh, to be the to be build the big bikes. <laughs> keep it to be continued. Okay, <laughs> let's all go to court together. Right? Okay. All right. That Next, terrible. six bucks. Six bucks. Let's go. Lock your stuff. Make sure you lock your stuff. Okay. Um, we get, okay. So this is clear. Now, what a person does not have to save another asset if doing so will come at a personal loss. Which brings us now to case B, with this lady walking by the store, right, and she sees the air conditioners on. Does she have? We asked the question, is she, having, is she going to find the owner, to call the owner, tell the owner, hey, your air conditioner is going to run for five days. Um, is that nice? Is it uh, is a moral, a moral, a moral a, or is it an obligation, according no. to Torah? Moral, huh? moral obligation. No, just nice. Basically, no, not what you think. <laughs> Put away your mind for a moment. Basically, we just learned 
and you have an obligation. Why do not stand? Do not stand idle. Won't watch somebody else from. He's having a loss, right? They're having a loss. Is it costing? Is it costing you money to call the person? No. No. Right. So in that case, it doesn't cost you any money. It might be. It might. It might come at a an inconvenience. You have to start calling, find out who the owner is. Right. But as it doesn't cost you any money, you have an obligation in case B to call and find out. Okay, if we're gonna see in text 10, um, page 95, page 92, sorry. If we encounter lost items of insignificant value to the point that if they were our own, we would not bother to collect them or take them home, right? We are nevertheless obligated to make the necessary effort to restore them to the owner. Maybe that's the bike answer, right? <laughs> right? Maybe I don't care because the bike, the kid's bike happened to be a broken bike. Okay. So it's probably worth nothing. 20 bucks. Okay. You fix it. It was all bike. I thought I wouldn't leave such a bike. They, took it to fix and bring it back. they bought it for they bought it for scrap, right? Yeah. So I I I don't care so much, but that doesn't give me an exemption from uh from saying the say same applies to the other items, right? So nevertheless, obligated to make the effort to restore them to the owner. The rationale is that we have the right to relinquish our, our possession if their value is outweighed by the physical burden they impose. However, we have no right to unilaterally relinquish someone else's ownership over their possessions. The Torah does not allow us to spare any effort, even if the effort is great and the value of the item is minimal. So we must care about somebody else's loss no matter what. Even if I myself couldn't care if it would be mine, I have as long as it doesn't cost me any money, right? So, um, because you could say, if I would have the store, right? I couldn't care if the air conditioner is on, right? Big deal, how much is it gonna cost me? It's just overnight, two more dollars? I have to go and make myself crazy? That's your way you're looking at it, but maybe if the store owner does care, you don't know that, so you should go and seek them out. Um, so the question now is, um, What happens if you didn't fulfill your obligation by preventing somebody's loss, right? Let's say you watch, uh, you see your neighbor's bike outside, right? And you didn't call the neighbor. You didn't call the neighbor. And Tom would say, call the neighbor, tell the neighbor about it. You didn't do it. The next morning, the bike is gone. Am I now obligated to pay the neighbor for the bike? No. Based on what we learn in Torah. Maybe I do. If I have an obligation to prevent somebody from loss, maybe I have to pay if I didn't take action. See, in America, if you save somebody else's life, what happens? They sue you, right? They sue you. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. So, if, if, so, so, so the Torah says, well, text 11. Those who could write, rightfully testify for someone but fail to do so are not legally liable to provide compensation for the damage they could have prevented. So there's no legal compensation. However, such people will not be granted divine forgiveness until they pay for the damage. <laughs> pay for the damage. If you had the ability to prevent a loss and you didn't take your obligation by doing so, so in the court, in the court I cannot make you pay for the damage, but in heavenly court, you should go and pay because it, you, 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 you violated a clear commandment of yes. not yes. standing yes. idle. We're seeking you to be a good person. Yeah, because, I'm a good person. because, because <laughs> we, no, no, one second, why is that so? You, us, teaching us. Why is that so? We have, we are guarantors. We have a responsibility for each other. Right? If you, we are like guarantors. His items and my items, I have, I have, a, I'm a custodian of that, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't, cannot make you pay in the court of law, but from a spiritual perspective, you sinned, and in order to be absolved from that sin between you and God, go and pay your neighbor for the loss that you could have prevented. I'm not talking about uh, paying money for the prevention. That, that you don't have to, but you simply make a phone call. Hey. I see your bike is outside. And you just swear, I'm in the middle of a movie. I couldn't care less. 
it's not good. Yes. Yes. The divine forgiveness. Yeah. You have to pay for the damage. Mm -hmm. and where and when does one have to pay? In Olam Haba? No. In Olam Hazen. Worry about. Yes. If okay, that's yeah, if the person died, if the owner is no longer alive, let's say no, you know, not, not, not the owner, the person who could have testified or could have saved yeah. the and if he he's no longer or she yeah uh, won't get forgiveness yeah. until they pay for the damage. Yeah. So they say, I'll wait and all of a while pay God. No, or I'll pay the, pay the, you have to pay the owner, you're not paying God. <laughs> How are you going to pay the owner in Olam Haba? <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's, there's no pockets in the in, in your shrouds. Huh? He's a real lawyer. This is not the material fact. Divine forgiveness is not something material. So the same thing with the payment. No, 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 no. Look, if if you if we if you if again if you live a life. If you like, if you live a life by the principles, right? That I just want to get through this world, right? I'll be, I'll, 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 as long as I'll get into trouble, then your, then your, your approach is, is, is you have, a, you have a good argument, right? But as a Jew, we have an approach that we want to be on good standing with Hashem, and we want to be on right standing with each other, and they all interconnected. That means the person that passes away has to give an accounting to Hashem up in heaven after we die. We want to make sure, actually, before we pass away, that's actually one of the Jewish values, that before we pass away, to, to make sure that there's nothing binding. In other words, if you owe somebody money, for example, and somebody's on the deathbed, they should make sure to pay back before they go up to him. And even if that didn't happen, then the heirs should make sure to pay back. It will be a, as a responsibility or an honor for the father. So we don't want to be tied down because we are so into, into it. We never want to be tied down. That's we ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness for Yom Kippur. We ask for forgiveness at the funeral, right? What, do we, what does the rabbi say? At this point, it is appropriate to ask for forgiveness if we did something to the deceased. It's not too late. And also we, we are encouraged to, to forgive. It's very powerful. We're encouraged to forgive the deceased so they're not tied to coming up to heaven with some type of baggage. Mm. Uh, huh? It's very hard. You want the easy stuff? <laughs> no, no. There's a church across the street. <laughs> no, no offense. <laughs> Jesus is not easy. It's a, li it's a life of responsibility. Yes. It was so easy uh, to do so right stuff and everything. But when we came to the United States, really, I put everywhere my own business. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yep. And I was hesitated to Get say something, to do something because of this. Mm -hmm. in, in my country, we, we can, you know, if child does something wrong, we can help him, but here, yeah, they got bodies and stuff. But here, so that brings us to the next conversation. Good. Thank you, Sima. So the question is, if I see somebody doing something wrong, must I speak up yes or no? So in America, they say, mind your business, right? Mm -hmm. But what does Torah say? So right before the, the verse, love your feet like yourself, there's another verse. Leviticus 19, 12, uh, 17, it's text 12, page 94. You shall surely critique your fellow, and you will not share in their guilt. It's a mitzvah that you should critique your fellow. If you see somebody else doing something wrong, you should rebuke them. That is a certain people are expert in this mitzvah. They're, they're <laughs> very passionate about this mitzvah. You know those people, right? They'll always tell you that you're doing something wrong. <laughs> right? And they feel it as an obligation because if you don't, what does it say? You will not, you will share the guilt. If you're watching somebody doing something wrong, you don't speak up. Now it's going to be my guilt because we're all interconnected, right? But listen, my mind comes in to the rescue. It says as follows. Very important. 
13, text 13. One should not say, I will act righteously, and if others choose to stray from the path of righteousness, that it is a matter that is between them and God. This attitude is antithetical to Torah values, mind your own business, that's against Torah values. Rather, we are commanded to do the right thing ourselves and to see to it that others too conduct themselves appropriately. It is your business. It is your business. And if we, and, um, and, 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 and we are held accountable to it, right? You will, not sh you will share in the guilt if you watch them happen. So now how do we do that practical? Amanda says the next text. When we critique others, rather regarding an interpersonal issue or a religious matter, it should be done, number one, in private. We must speak patiently and gently, clarifying that we are motivated solely by their welfare and our desire that they may reward in the world to come. In other words, it has to come. What the next verse says, love your fellow like yourself. Why am I rebuking somebody else? Because I love them, because I care about them. When it's critic, when when you criticize somebody out of care, and out of and you say it's with sensitivity in private, words that come from the heart will enter their heart. But if it's like people enjoy, right? My ego of joy is, hey, you did something wrong, and in shul, hey, you, shut your phone up. You're violating the Sabbath, right? <laughs> this guy loves it, right? <laughs> or. or <laughs> <laughs> or when the guy reads the Torah and he makes a mistake, everyone loves screaming, eh, power, this, uh, everyone loves, and we love correcting other people, right? It's, it's human nature. As children, we love doing that, right? So, but that's not what the Torah says. The Torah says, look at it as an obligation, as more obligation, because we care for each other, because I love somebody else, and, um, and I want to I wanna help somebody else put them on the right path. And again, that is, but that is an obligation. So um, that brings us to the question about the, the, spirit, the religious question, case number C, right? We asked in case study C, so many Jews have rid of Jewish identity, right? Is it my business to teach somebody else about the Judaism? Is it my, is it my, is it, is it a nice thing to do? Is it encourage or is it an obligation? obligation. Huh? So. Well, we learned it is an obligation. Okay. Because just I was because I was told so. Because more than that, we are also responsible for each other. We are one nation. We're one people, and we do it because we care for each other. And now he left right. The Chabad, the Chabad philosophy is all about this idea, right? You meet a, we meet somebody who we ask, "Are you Jewish?" What do we say? Would you like to put on tefillin, like the Shabbat candles, right? Why do I care if you, why do I care that you should prompt a film? Huh? Yeah, but it's my, it's my mitzvah. Why do I care about that you should do the mitzvah? Huh? Yeah. Because, because we are one people, yeah. right? Because you're so much so interconnected and I care about you. I want to encourage you lovingly with, with not judgmental way, like Chabad does it, right? To teach you to do the mitzvah. Not to say, you know, I'm religious, I'm good, I don't care about all the rest of the Jewish people. That's, that's not the Torah way. <laughs> it's interesting how this is also in legal mitzvah. When it comes to mitzvahs, there's a lot of, leg there's a lot of legalities, how to perform a mitzvah. And I'm gonna give you one sample here that, that is very interesting, actually. Not so hard, very interesting. That brings out this point. So you know, when you do a mitzvah, before you do a mitzvah, you have to make a blessing, right? Before, 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 before every mitzvah, what's the blessing? Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam, right? Asher Kiddushanu Metzos Vetzivanu, blessed are you Hashem, who commanded us to Lahadlik Ne'er Chanukah, Lahadlik Shabbat, uh, the Shabbos candles, to put on to film, to blow the shofar. Depending what the mitzvah is, the end of the mit of the blessing is regarding to that particular mitzvah. Here's a question. It's Rosh Hashanah. It's Rosh Hashanah, right? and you slept in, or you're a doctor and you couldn't come to services. And at six o'clock p.m., last hour Rosh Hashanah, you are now um, going down to the lobby of the, of the hospital, and in the hospital lobby, you see Yankel's chauffeur in his closet, right? He has a little cubby, 
to shofar. But you didn't hear the shofar yet. You know how to blow the shofar. It's not your shofar. Are you permitted to take his shofar and blow the shofar to fulfill the mitzvah? Yes. Why? It's his property. It's a good deal. Huh? You're not stealing. Why would you blow the shofar? It's good. Without asking, without, without permission. <coughs> Just because, uh, huh? Because you're not stealing, you're borrowing. Huh? Borrowing for 10 minutes. Borrowing for 10 minutes. So I borrow your car 10 minutes out of your knowledge. How would you feel? <laughs> Yeah. You got it. You got it. Keep the car. <laughs> no, it's not a matter. It's a question. It's, it's property. So we learned the lesson one, right? That, you know, about the parking your car and somebody's uh, driving without the knowledge. If there's no loss, right? If there's no loss, it's not a problem. So look at text 15, page 95. It is permissible to use someone else's sofa without advanced permission in order to fulfill the mitzvah. Why? We assume that people will happily oblige others to perform a mitzvah with their possessions, provided that no financial loss is incurred as a result. What did they say? <laughs> 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 yeah, you're so what they say about assuming? Wait, uh, sorry, somebody had a question. What, what was the question on Zoom? You know what they say about assuming? Assuming. Yeah. What do they say about assuming? It makes an ass out of you and me. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, what else? How about in these days when uh, disease is rampant? Okay. There's a sanitary issue and use someone else's shelter. Okay. We're talking before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking before the audience. Hence, if was vaccinated or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay, yeah, that yeah. that can that, that, that can be, it, but that can, uh, you can sanitize the shelter for later. It doesn't, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you have you have a you have a thought, um, but it says here that what? But but what's the premise? Not just because oh there's no loss, but more than that, we we say that what? That we are responsible. We are responsible for each other. So we we assume that the other Jew also feels for the for the Jew. So if he would have been here, we said for sure use my shofar. Now that he's not here. Okay, but we assume that, that he would for sure because he feels that obligation for each other. It also depends how we're assuming. assuming. We're, again, we're assuming. Okay. All right. Um, but if there is a loss, then then if there's a loss, for example, if you have if, if you find somebody's Shabbos candles, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to take the Shabbos candles, I like the Shabbos candles, that is a loss to somebody else. Even if you say, I'm going to pay them back, that doesn't give you permission to take somebody's property because maybe it's his grandmother's uh, candles that he kept for 50 years, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good movie. So and, uh, it's yeah. a good movie you should watch. Um, it's an Israeli movie called Ushpizim. Mm -hmm. Called Ushpizim. It's about an etrog. It's about an etrog. Uh, and and it's, uh, there's two criminals come out of Israeli prison and they, they meet their old friend who became religious. And they, they basically, they see his etrog that he spent a lot of money for. And they just say, oh, they make me their own salad and take it and chop it. For their salad, a hundred dollar, a thousand dollar etrog. Anyway, but it's a, it's a very interesting movie. So side note, that's what it's. All right, moving on. Um, question now is, when I make a when I make a blessing, when I make a mitzvah, for example, uh, kiddush on Shabbos, I make kiddush. So, the, so when I say the blessing before, right? Blessed are you, Lord, who commanded us to make the kiddush. What happens if I make kiddush ten o'clock in the morning, and now at twelve o'clock, right, uh, more people come into the shul and they didn't hear kiddush. Can I make Kiddush again? Can I make a second time with Kiddush? Yep. Huh? Yeah. Huh? So this is the rule. Look at text 17. Yeah. 17. The rule is as follows. This is the rule. Whoever is not personally obligated in a particular mitzvah cannot perform it on behalf of others. Meaning, I can only, I can only help somebody fulfill the mitzvah if I am obligated. Okay, so which means, for example, blow the shofar, right? Who can blow, who blows the shofar? Everybody has a mitzvah to hear the shofar, right? But does everybody blow the shofar? No. It's typically one guy, right, who has to go blows it, 
and he makes the blessing, and everybody listens in, says Amen. And by him blowing the show for everybody else, everybody else in the room fulfills the mitzvah, the obligation of listening to the show. Clear? It's also not, easy huh? it's not so easy. All right, sorry. That's right. But the person, let's say the person's not Jewish. Right? Let's say there's a synagogue, doesn't have a rabbi, knows how to blow. Yeah, but they know somebody in the orchestra who knows how to blow trumpets. Right? He's a Gentile. Can he, can we invite him to come to the synagogue Rosh Hashanah? Put him on the beam and say, hey, you blow the shofar and we can fulfill the mitzvah. I don't think huh? he, it, they would not fulfill the obligation because only a person who has the obligation themselves can be the one to include others in the mitzvah. Okay? So it's, nothing, it's not a personal thing. It's a legal Jewish thing, right? That's why children are also not uh, able to blow the shofar until the bar mitzvah. To blow for others. But can you huh? a non-Jew to blow for? No, 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 you can't. You cannot. I mean, he could blow. He can blow it as a nice uh, musical yeah, instrument, but not to fulfill yeah. the mitzvah on Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Um, so when you see somebody, it doesn't matter if you do or not. But for that, what's the answer with the wine? Oh, so what's the answer to the wine? Because you're already fulfilled the obligation. Well, so it technically, huh? So that once you fulfill the obligation, so we can say, okay, now you have no, now no, because the obligation is to have Kiddush Shabbos day, one Kiddush, right? You've done it already. You don't have an obligation anymore. So can you now do Kiddush again to include others? Maybe you're like just a Gentile, just like the Gentile has no obligation, you have no wrong obligation either. You as a rabbi, yes. <laughs> Nothing to do with the rabbi, text yes. Text 19 says yes. Oh, you jumped ahead. Yes. So text 18 oh. says, the text 18, Talmud says, hey, with regards to all blessing, the rule is that people who have fulfilled their own obligation can nevertheless repeat it for the sake of causing others to fulfill their obligation. Why? Because your obligation is my obligation. Because you didn't do it yet, it becomes my obligation. The whole idea we learned today in class, right? Okay. That we are all interconnected. Mm -hmm. That's why I can go after Shul and Rosh Hashanah. I go out, go to the nursing home, and I go there and blow the shofar again. Mm -hmm. As a student, a Shiva student, we went to Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And we went around and we blew the shofar 10, 15 times. I was not blowing. But we were able to do so over and over because we are allowing, giving the message to others. This is exactly a text 19. The reason for this law is that all Jews are responsible for each other in the midst of related matters. Consequently, if my fellow hasn't yet fulfilled their midst obligation, I haven't completely fulfilled my own obligation either. So with this, let us now end with case study C, <coughs> my obligation towards our fellow Jews who are not religious, who don't, I don't know about becoming religious, but do I do I have an obligation? Not just a communal obligation, right? Communal obligations, right? People say, okay, the Jewish community needs to make sure there's a Jewish community, right? Not my problem. <laughs> Not my problem, right? I was, when, 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 I, when I go around and uh, ask people to partner and support, right? To fund the activities for the community, right? Some people like to say, it's not my problem, right? So there's no school, not my problem. Let somebody else take care of it. <coughs> there's an analogy to this. <coughs> okay. Was it, I give the analogy. It's an analogy that Talmud says that we will grow up as children. Just to give you a value, a simple teaching, right? When, when it comes to tzedakah, everybody else should do it, right? You know that. Um, quick analogy. So it was a king who came to this uh, town. There were a town of winemakers. A town of winemakers. Everybody was a winemaker. And the king said, I'm coming to town to visit. So the town got together. How are we, gonna, how are we going to uh, welcome the king? So the idea was to build a big barrel. And everybody's going to give one ba little barrel of wine, pour it in. And then there's going to be a collective big barrel of wine from everybody else. And everybody had to, at the end of the week, had to come at any time and just pour their barrel to fulfill the obligation. All right, that was the decree. Okay, first the uncle says, it's going to be a thousand people. I don't want to give away my little barrel of wine. So I'm going to pour some water. It's going to be mixed amongst the other, right? 
And then Yosel thought the same thing, right? How is that pour water? Because it's going to be one, one, one out of a thousand. You're not going to notice it. Okay, you know what happens? The king comes, he opens up. Hey, we have the best wine in the world. And it's water. Right? Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, no. All right, so here, let's watch the Rebbe's, uh, actually from the Rebbe's uh, video, a video that actually the Rebbe speak about our mutual responsibility for each other, which is very powerful. I'm going to speak. The Sarvas call is Royal Arabian Zebaze. Not the Smink in a fila Aiden was given to her because we tell you, who never said me ten came all me to Zaming it often. Punta Zeve Zir, Hotter the Hlib, on me did it, so non Agbolis. Hat er sich da sein der Ringen von Avas Israel aufzutreten. Und ich weiß, da steht, dass er die Jahre ist in der Mini, in der Mini von Tero Mitzvah, an welche Tale jeden Arabi in selber sehe, sie können sein der Limo, der Tere beschleimus und der Kima Mitzvah beschleimus, beschaut sich auch heilig von ihm, was kann ich so, kommen ja, hat es auch keine Schleimo, ist auch der heilig, Okay. Sorry, those on Zoom, we got disconnected. We're back on. Kamer, wie die Wettbewerbs, die Bäh, 
All right, so let's. So I am concerned as the feeling of mutual Jewish responsibility is on the lesson three beyond taking offense. One, Judaism has a very broad definition of mutual responsibility. It's based on a vision of shared purpose and mission, which is influenced by each action of every person. Two, in addition to a shared mission, Jewish mysticism teaches that our souls are united. Three, Jewish law considers it a crime to remain silent when aware of a threat to someone else's life. And it also mandates that we extend every effort necessary to protect others from monetary loss. Four, the Jewish value of mutual responsibility calls on us to guide others away from transgression of the Torah's commandments. This must be done gently and be motivated by genuine concern for their spiritual welfare. Five. Jewish law also teaches that we are responsible to assist others in the performance of its God. Our own mitzvah observance is incomplete until we do so. All right. Everybody enjoyed. Hopefully, any questions? Last minute questions? So, you think I should press charges? Yeah, so yeah, next time they will steal something else. That's true. Uh, Rabbi, yes. they stole my bike in Venice, Florida, too. And I um, actually, it was at the beach ferry, and I we saw on video who stole it, and we knew he was homeless. So in this case, I decided not to press charges. But later on, we heard that there were many stolen bikes in the in the community and that they were all stolen by the drug addicts so it's yeah. very difficult i decided not to press charges but it's very difficult right what the young or older like, what the kids like no the, older they're older older like 40 50 80, oh, it looks like in the 50s oh they are professional thieves. the fashion thieves. real serious pets we are, we are, we are, we are, we are in the process actually. It's it's seven it's seventy thousand dollars. Who wants to sponsor it? <laughs> yes. Okay. We. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have I have nothing I, I am very bored I have nothing else to do right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's a, it's, 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 my question is always, what's my obligation? Not what I'm in the mood of doing, or what, what's what the moral obligation? Huh? They watch your house or whatever bike was. Yeah, yeah. They knew that bike was stolen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Cameras, cameras don't prevent uh, crimes. They don't care. <coughs> yes. No. All right. So be continuous. See you next week. Happy Shabbos, everyone. Thank you.